The universe is the mysterious creation of a vast intelligence. The origin of the world and life is beyond human understanding. The Vedas describe how consciousness is transformed into energy and matter. This process of creation and becoming is going on today, right now. This is not a theory or a religious doctrine. With these keys of understanding, you can see it for yourself. Namaste. So let's talk about consciousness. Consciousness means the relationship between a subject and an object. Usually the subject is I, and the object is something that we perceive through our senses. So in any case, there has to be a duality between the subject and the object, and that's what creates the relationship of consciousness. Consciousness is the relation between the subject and the object. Therefore, if there is no duality, there can be no consciousness. Try to understand this. If we actually attain a non-dual state, that in that state there is no consciousness. It can't be, because there's no duality. So terms like transcendental consciousness or non-dual consciousness are actually oxymorons. An oxymoron is two things that just don't go together. Uh, like the horns of a hare is the classic example. You know, rabbits don't have horns. <laughs> Horses don't have wings either. <laughs> so these terms that people throw around are actually very misleading. Now, we just did quite a study on tattva. I'll link to the videos here. And in that study, we found that there is a very small range of tattvas, or principles of existence, where non-dual consciousness is possible. Let's take a look at them briefly. Parashiva emits the Shiva tattva, the Shakti tattva, Sadashiva tattva, Ishwara tattva, and Shuddha Vidya Tattva. And these are all part of the non-dual creation. But how do we access those tattvas? Well, the only way for a human being, for a jiva, to access these tattvas is through moksha. Moksha means a state of liberation. And there are five types of moksha, which we've gone over in previous uh, videos. I'll link to a video here that goes over it. So anyway, you can go to the planet where the Supreme is present, or you can uh, be a servant or other associate of the Supreme in any, any form, or you can have uh, similar opulences as the Supreme. And this one is interesting because it's called Sarshti. Sarshti is the possessive form of the word Srishti, which means creation. So of the creation, what's that? The creator. So you can go to the planet of Brahma, you can go to the planet of Vishnu, and you can be with them, you can stay with them for a long time, but not forever. Uh, there's a distinction between moksha and mukti. Moksha is the product of a long process of austerity and worship. 
usually many lifetimes. And this gives us the ability or the, the gift, the benediction of going to the higher planets and being with the different forms of the Godhead. But this is not permanent. One limitation on moksha is the amount of good karma that we have. And this isn't, you know, this is not just an individual thing. There are plenty of stories in the Puranas, for example, of Indra interfering with the uh, tapasya of yogis when they start to get too powerful. Uh, he has a, a way of sending these dancing girls from heavenly planets to interfere with their austerities. So, although Vishnu is not as, probably not as mendacious as Indra, <laughs> still, uh, you can imagine that Vishnu might not want somebody to become as powerful as he is. Uh, so he might get in the way too. Shiva doesn't care. <laughs> Shiva would give boons to anybody, even a demon. <laughs> but there, are, uh, there is competition for this moksha. That's the point. There is uh, different hurdles and obstacles to overcome. Whereas mukti, on the other hand, is liberation. It's permanent. Once you get mukti, that's it. You're gone. You're out of here. You never come back. Not even as a demigod or as a Vishnu or whatever. It's over. So really, we should be going towards mukti, not moksha. So even if we become Shiva, huh, that's still uh, only good until the end of the universe. And then it's finished. So try to understand, there is a limited range of tattvas wherein non-dual consciousness is possible, but those have to be attained by moksha and that state is impermanent. So the only real non-dual state is mukti. And mukti, once attained, does not have consciousness. Why? Because it's non-dual. Dual is, dualism is a necessary precondition for consciousness to exist. So this throws a lot of theories out the window. A lot of theories about spiritual life that you can go to this planet or that planet or you can go to the heavenly uh, places, or you can become a demigod, or you can even become God. Uh, a lot of people theorize like this, but it's not so. And even if it is possible, it's not going to be really good for you. You get to enjoy for a while, yeah, but then it's over, and you have to come back again into this world, and you have to suffer. So we can't recommend the types of sadhana that lead to mystic powers, heavenly rebirth, or even rebirth as a god. Huh? Because even though you might get to experience an expanded state of consciousness and the, the pleasure that goes along with that, ultimately it's not permanent. It's over when your karma is used up or it's over at the end of the universe. So this is the thing. Real liberation means transcending consciousness itself. This is a big sticking point for a lot of people. It was for me for many years. And it hindered my full acceptance of liberation, mukti until I started to understand, wait a minute, consciousness is, depends on duality, and duality means rebirth and suffering. Hey, I don't want that. I want to be beyond that. I want to have mukti. I want to have liberation. I want to be beyond that. I want to have moksha. 
I want to have permanent, complete liberation from material existence and duality. So, what is this state like? Well, it's not like anything. I've been exploring it recently in my meditations and deep in the night. <laughs> and what it's like, it's like being a stone, but a stone that's made of pure awareness, a stone that's made of pure being. What is awareness? Awareness would be consciousness if it had an object. But if it doesn't have an object, it simply is awareness. And there's nothing that it is aware of. It is only aware that it is. In other words, you can't say that pure awareness is awareness of being. No. It is awareness that I am. Think about this for a minute. If pure awareness cannot have an object in order to be non-dual, then it can't be an awareness of self or I, because self and I as concepts require the existence of another. Huh? There's I and then there's you. <laughs> there's self and there's not self and there's a boundary between them. But in the non-dual state there are no boundaries. So the being, beingness of the absolute is an awareness which includes that being. The being and the awareness are non-different. See, in dualistic consciousness, being and consciousness are different. They're just duality. I can be aware that I am. I can be aware of my consciousness even. I can be conscious of my conscious, consciousness. I can be conscious of my awareness. But that's still dualistic. To go beyond duality, one simply is. And that is, that isness, that beingness, includes awareness. I would call it amness. Not I am, because there is no I. But just amness, the feeling of amness. Now, we all have this feeling. We all experience this at every moment. We always have and we always will. Because why? Fundamentally, beneath all the coverings, we are Brahman. It's always been like that. It always will be like that. See, this is the state that Ramana talked about. Ramana Maharshi would say, Brahman is already realized. Why are you trying so hard? <laughs> Why are you making all these efforts, sacrifices, austerities, meditations, all this stuff? Are you aware? If yes, then Brahman is already realized. Are you aware that you are? Are you aware that you're aware? If yes, Brahman is already realized. You see, the problem of self-realization is not about a certain type of consciousness. It is simply the recognition of what Brahman is and then seeing that in oneself. That can happen in a moment. It's simply a matter of understanding and looking within and finding the state 
that matches that understanding. That is the peak of self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.